Good evening. It's uh, six o'clock, so we can start. Uh, I would like to welcome to this uh, fourth webinar organized by Ledro and Judicarian Alps Biosphere Reserve as part of this uh, Proud to Share Week Outdoor Experience and Sustainability. It's an initiative uh, full of uh, events, an entire week of study visits, panels, discussion, and webinars. The main topic of the initiative is focused on uh, outdoor disciplines related to four main themes. Climate change, that we deepen in the first webinar, accessibility, deepen in the second one, discovering the territory through outdoor disciplines, that was the theme of yesterday's webinar, and uh, carrying capacity, that is the focus of this webinar of today. In today's webinar, we will deepen uh, how outdoor disciplines must be managed in order to guarantee the respect of the carrying capacity of a territory and uh, uh, in order to be a driver through sustainability. Uh, we will uh, go uh, around Europe uh, with the best practice offered by three Biosphere Reserve, and we thank the representatives uh, to be here with us today. After our relator uh, presentation uh, that uh, uh, will be shared uh, also with uh, uh, some images um, and we hope that could be in inspiration uh, for uh, the other territories that are uh, listening to this webinar, you're welcome in posing your question, reflection or deepening requests. Uh, we think it's a precious moment uh, not only to know other uh, biosphere reserve, but also to develop a discussion. So please feel free uh, as participants to interact in the last part, uh, mostly in the last part of the, this webinar through chat or question and answer button. Uh, if someone uh, would like to directly intervene, he can uh, raise his hand and I will uh, send um, a request to open the microphone. But uh, mm, feel free to intervene in any moment uh, throughout the uh, chat or answer and question button. These, as far as uh, technical matters are concerned, uh, to go deep in the theme and uh, to enter the um, focus of this uh, webinar, I give the floor to Erika Mingotto, that is uh, our uh, uh, moderator of today's webinar, coming from CISET, that is the International Center for Touristic Economic Study. Thank you, Erika, to be with us. The floor is yours. Thank you. So good afternoon or good evening to everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, last webinar of the Proud to Share Week uh, uh, organized, as just said, by the Alpi Ledrenzi and Giudicaria UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. Um, as just said, I'm Erika Mingotto. I'm a researcher at uh, CISET uh, from Kaposkari University in Venice. And uh, in particular, my, my research focus is uh, sustainable development of uh, tourist destinations and of tourist companies. So I, I, I'm the moderator for, uh, of today's webinar. And uh, as just said, in the previous three webinars, we talked about uh, climate change, accessibility, outdoor tourism. Now the focus is uh, carrying capacity, and in particular, tourism carrying capacity and managing the needs of the territory uh, while guaranteeing the conservation of habitats. So carrying capacity is an extremely important topic in tourism when it comes to the development of tourist destinations. And especially in, in those places that are particularly sensitive and vulnerable, such as naturalistic areas. Uh, so the concept of carrying capacity is closely linked to, uh, to sustainable tourist development. But uh, uh, the concept of carrying capacity is not easy to, uh, to be implemented. And so um, the cases of these uh, three UNESCO biosphere reserves that we have the pleasure to, uh, of discussing today, uh, I think can, uh, can give us uh, some very useful and, uh, and insightful uh, inputs. So um, I would like to, to introduce to, to you our three speakers. Um, so Harold Brenner, 
for the Wienerwald Biosphere Reserve in Austria. Is the responsible for the nature management uh, in the uh, biosphere reserve. So we have uh, Andrew Bell, uh, the chief executive officer in the North Devon Biosphere Reserve in England. And uh, last but not least, uh, Lars Korn uh, for the Southeast Lugan Biosphere Reserve in, uh, in Germany. And so he is a forester and uh, a member of the team of the uh, of the South East Rugen Biosphere Reserve. So before starting with uh, the first speaker, uh, I would like to remind uh, again that uh, the webinar is uh, registered and uh, the webinar will be uh, uploaded in the, in the website of the uh, Alpi Ledrens and Judicaria UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. So we will have the, the opportunity to, uh, to, 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 to see the, the webinar um, uh, next week. And, uh, um, I would like to remind also that uh, you can type uh, all your questions in the Q&A section or in, uh, in chat. Uh, after all the presentation, there will be a discussion with uh, our guest, and so uh, there will be the, uh, the opportunity to, to, to share some of your questions with, uh, uh, with them. Uh, so we, we leave all questions at the final uh, discussion. And uh, uh, another technical aspect, um, for Italian people, there is the opportunity to have the translation in Italian. So uh, in, the, uh, in the bar, you can find uh, on the lower um, part of, of your Zoom screen, you can choose uh, in which language you prefer to follow the, uh, the webinar. So the original language in English or there is the, the Italian uh, translation. So, I think we can start with the first speaker. So, uh, Harold Bremer for the Wienerwald uh, Biosphere Reserve. And so, Harold, the floor is, uh, is yours. And I remind 20 minutes for, uh, for the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. So, hello and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, from beautiful Wienerwald in Austria. I was asked, and I'm really proud to share with you our experience when it comes to mountain biking. And uh, therefore, I would like to share my screen with you. Um, so it uh, should be done right now. I do hope and I see uh, yes, that it's done successfully. So once more, uh, welcome to the presentation from Biosphere Reserve Wienerwald. And uh, let's have a look about um, on our experience when it comes to mountain biking. Before doing so, I would like to give you some rough ideas and just some short introduction about the region I'm working within. So the Biosphere Reserve Wienerwald is funded by Lower Austria and Vienna and is officially member of the UNESCO Network of Biosphere Reserves globally since 2005. We have a unique landscape and biodiversity at the outskirts of a city of nearly 2 million inhabitants. So keep in mind that uh, Viennese inhabitants are really uh, members and forming and working on the idea for sustainable development here within this very special area I'm working in. Uh, we have, when it comes to nature, a uh, standout value, so to say, with uh, the beach uh, consisting as the, our main tree species, forming a really contiguous mixed deciduous forest in Central Europe. And the Biosphere Reserve is uh, funded equally by Lower Austria and Vienna. Uh, when we have a look at the, the map, just to uh, give some uh, short idea about where uh, Vienna and the Biosphere Reserve is located, you uh, see indicated by the red line the western part and the districts of Vienna forming the most eastern part of the Biosphere Reserve Wienerwald, and it uh, sums up to about 10% of the Biosphere Reserve area uh, being located in Vienna, and about 90% are uh, close to in Lower Austria. You uh, see on the map as well the dark green uh, spotted areas uh, being our core area and summing up to 37 uh, different core areas, summing up to 5% of the total uh, biosphere reserve area and being uh, 
so to say, forests uh, which were managed before and which are untouched uh, and no forest management is carried out anymore. We have the buffer zone indicated in yellow color, uh, summing up to 31% of the total area. And um, if you may have been in the area before, uh, it's uh, mainly the meadows, it's the mixture the Wienerwald is famous for, so it's not only forest land, it's the mixture of forest and meadows, and uh, the buffer zone is mainly uh, special uh, meadows within the biosphere reserve. So as you can imagine, uh, with uh, the inhabitants and with the location pretty close to Vienna, we have uh, several uh, tasks and uh, challenges uh, when it comes to ecosystem services. Uh, we should not only think about uh, timber production, about uh, mushroom and berry picking. Uh, it's especially important for Lower Austria and Vienna as well that uh, the Wienerwald is a famous and uh, appreciated recreational area. Uh, the Wienerwald provides, so to say, fresh air for 2 million people. Uh, our scientific uh, studies showed uh, that uh, the ecosystem service the Wienerwald is providing uh, is an equivalent to three, 23 million air conditioning units approximately uh, for the city of Vienna when especially thinking about the climate change and the climate crisis we're living in is a really uh, highly and highest to value uh, thing. So. Uh, when we are talking about forest uh, adventure as a tourist offer, it's uh, a potential we uh, have to keep in mind uh, for the uh, whole sustainable development. Uh, but also for sure it has a backside as everything uh, due to the highly uh, leisure and recreational pressure on the area, we would get uh, problems when it comes to damaging things or when it comes uh, just to garbage. Uh, we see the necessity of uh, projects for visitor information and uh, guidance. Uh, and uh, but last but not least, uh, everyone wants a house in a green cut side, but uh, basically no one wants the tree to be cut down to build this house. So that's also kind of a uh, tension and a, a field we're working within. But uh, as you see, the recreational area uh, is uh, the link to mountain biking and uh, the issue I want to focus a little bit more on. So I've heard uh, we have a pretty international background uh, here. So maybe it's uh, interesting and necessary uh, to understand the legal background of mountain biking in Austria. When it comes to mountain biking in the forest, uh, the Austrian forest law uh, says that you have to have the permission from the ground owners uh, to come up with the officially marked uh, trail where you're just allowed to bike, so you're not allowed to go uh, and to ride your bike through the forest where you feel like uh, you have to uh, ride on officially marked trails. And the question I raised a little bit uh, here is uh, who cares about that? Uh, when you go out in the forest and uh, have a look what's happening out there, uh, you just see people building their jumps, cutting down trees to uh, build their trails and tracks, even coming up with uh, some special constructions uh, for uh, challenging trails. Uh, if you search in the web and in the internet, you find uh, these uh, dig your own uh, trail park uh, issue. So, um, it was honestly, it was a little bit of a surprise for me when it was now in 2014, a rather small mountain bike club, uh, Wienerwald Trails, uh, started talking and uh, yeah, came up with the initiative to uh, develop mountain biking. I mean, if you, uh, or if what they told us and if we, what we saw and learned uh, was uh, if you have a look at uh, the trails and the tracks we provide here in the Wienerwald or we provided in the Wienerwald, you see that those uh, trails uh, were established in 1990. And uh, in 2014, uh, there was a development in the bike. I mean, you have a look at your mobile next to you probably and uh, just Google after the webinar uh, how mobiles looked like in the 90s and then you just compare these two items and uh, more or less the same happened with the mountain bikes. So uh, we had a, a real, really 
big pressure uh, on uh, working on uh, this issue, on finding new ways uh, with uh, talking, with discussing, and uh, keeping in mind what we want to do and where we want to go. So we established a platform, Mountain Biking, within the Wienerwald, uh, funding members which were uh, Wienerwald Trails, so the Mountain Biker Club I mentioned, Wienerwald Tourism, why uh, was the tourism uh, on board for the very first time? If you may just think uh, that's not a touristic issue from the very first beginning. Uh, it's uh, the legal situation, it's the contracts. Innova Tourism hold the, the contracts with the forest and ground owners. Uh, so providing the official uh, trail network uh, here in this region. We have Viennese Forestry Office, we have the or Austrian Federal Forests close to Neuburg Abbey and the Biosphere uh, Reserve Management acted more or less as the platform where all those may be also um, contradicting uh, interests uh, found them together on a, on a platform to discuss uh, things and develop uh, the, the mountain biking theme. So today uh, we're proud that we're uh, also uh, happy to welcome the Lower Austrian Mountain Bike Coordinator and the Viennese Trail Center in our platform. Uh, yeah, what happened? Uh, as you can imagine, if uh, you have a, a lot of uh, questions, unsolved problems, issues, uh, there are many meetings. We have many meetings in uh, through all over the re region and all over the area. Um, I think it's uh, uh, rather hard to imagine uh, the total area of the Biosphere Reserve Wienerwald is 105,000 hectares. So it's a big, big uh, area having a lot of uh, different uh, political parties and mayors and uh, different structures uh, being not that easy to uh, handle. And you just uh, have to, uh, to bring them together to have the discussion, to have an ongoing discussion, um, to include uh, people from pretty everywhere in the region to make it a, a success project, I would say. And uh, what also was a challenging uh, issue for us uh, was the discussion and finding ways on how to legalize new trails. I mean, we have the forest law, we have the nature protection law, uh, about uh, roughly said uh, 80 to 90% of the area is Natura 2000. Uh, so there are many steps uh, and many uh, issues to be solved before you just uh, say, okay, let's uh, build a new trail here and there. So our idea, uh, and uh, I wanna stress out that this was really important uh, to us, was also to provide a trails for all kinds of user categories. So we were not only trying to provide trails for the pros, our idea was to have uh, trails and roads uh, for like family uh, searching for creation on a Sunday, just having a nice ride through the forest, as well as a someone who really wants to push to the limits and go down uh, some uh, special tracks uh, built for that. So we came up with the idea we need uh, different categories. So we have the forest roads just for more or less uh, combining different tracks and trails or having some easy uh, place to go to. We have the single trails with uh, shared trails uh, where we see on the picture below, bikers and uh, hikers use uh, both. Uh, and we have single use with the trail center and the uh, trail park where um, it's a single use for mountain bikers only where people can really push themselves. So our first uh, project was the trail park Wedlingbach, a quite famous uh, location for bikers where we decided um, we need to, to, we also need a, a success, so to say, we need to, to come up and show what is possible to do and what can be done if people work together. So we started with uh, marking uh, the lines out there, uh, starting uh, to dig the trails. And I wanna uh, highlight that uh, this work was done by the volunteers from the club. So this was the mountain bikers who organized themselves, the machinery, the shovels, the members of the, of the club, uh, for sure they had uh, some people with the knowledge, with the experience helping them. And finally uh, coming up with the trails uh, which are suitable for basically everyone and uh, definitely uh, lowering the risk of uh, damaging or falling, of getting hurt. 
so um, we have the, the trail park as mentioned before with the two lines uh, and for sure we also ask ourselves do things change if we just uh, legalize new trails and new tracks uh, and uh, to get some idea on that we uh, came up with a mountain bike or monitoring on selected sites so before and after establishing this uh, trail park I mentioned before we saw uh, especially the newly built trails in the very first beginning the, attracted really uh, bikers and uh, bikers were going there to 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 use this uh, new attraction and uh, on the same side the number of rides in the core area went down where so to say illegal biking uh, was done uh, for sure uh, it would be very interesting to to have a look at uh, these figures and at this monitoring today um, the Wedlingbach uh, now is open for I think if I remember it probably about five years. So uh, we, it would be definitely worth uh, having a look uh, how things uh, point out today. We came up uh, also from our discussion project uh, processes with the different nature protection forestry agencies uh, on finding some guidelines for sustainable trails, uh, what to mention, what to keep in mind when you wanna come up with new trails. And um, we're still, uh, having ongoing negotiations for, to further increase the, the trail network uh, and provide new trails uh, just to give more loops since the idea is uh, especially for people from Vienna not to use the car uh, to go out in the Wienerwald to use the bike so to give them the idea or the possibility just to jump on their bike from their home and uh, uh, go biking in, in the Wienerwald. And last but not least, the Trail Center Wien uh, definitely is also some uh, some very special item we are really proud of uh, happening as, or uh, developing since uh, the Trail Center and the Biosphere Reserve uh, became proud partners. Uh, the Trail Center is a certified partner when it comes to education, because uh, we also see the lack of knowledge when it comes to the Biosphere Reserve in particular or in special, uh, but also when it comes to knowledge on, on nature, on damage, uh, uh, bikes can increase in nature. And uh, we think that it's uh, worth just uh, to, to give impressions and uh, explain people what uh, to do and what negative impact especially uh, they can, can cause. So right now uh, we have in the Wienerwald 1,350 kilometer mountain bike trails, uh, 90, 90 kilometers of which uh, are single trails. We have two mountain bike areas, Anninger and the northern part of Wienerwald. And uh, it was highly criticized that uh, the share of asphalt street on a so to say mountain bike uh, uh, routes was really high. So this uh, decreased by 32% to uh, allow people to better uh, navigate through the area. We have now days about uh, 6,000 uh, uh, navigation signs outside uh, in 2019. So what sounds to me as a pretty uh, impressive figures and data for sure is not the, the end of our project. Uh, so we are still working on the optimization of the trail network. We uh, wanna minimize the impact, especially in the uh, very sustainable and special core areas uh, we're having here. Uh, the issue there is erosion mainly, and for sure the uh, negative impact on, on wildlife. Uh, we're working on digitalization and communication, especially uh, when it comes to uh, closed trails uh, so that the biker wants to go out to ride the bike, uh, can inform him herself before going out uh, if uh, it's possible to, to use or uh, to go these uh, this, this trails. We're improving on the trail management. So to, uh, to yeah, just react in time when there is a trail sign missing or when a small ditch is coming up to just improve the trail, not to, to cause any, any big troubles out in, in the nature. Uh, we're still uh, trying to uh, evaluate our projects. And uh, right now we've started uh, with a touristic development. So uh, the first step maybe 
uh, here was done by Wienerwald Tourism. They are providing these days uh, e-mountain bike tours and, and trips to uh, special partners where you have a nice overview of the landscape of the area and you, uh, you're you able to uh, get really good food and uh, maybe some wine tasting, uh, stuff like that, uh, just to, to develop uh, the touristic part as well. So, uh, quickly done that's it from my side so uh thank you for listening and uh erica i may hand in the micro back to your hands well thank you very much thank you so much for this uh, insightful presentation um i think at dinner Bar, the biosphere reserve is uh, a very remarkable and also unique case uh, since uh, it is located uh, closer to um to a capital city, so Vienna is a very populated and uh, important economic area. And so this is, I think, uh, an important uh, issue to, to be considered. And um, from the touristic point of view, uh, the development of uh, bike tourism and uh, in particular of mountain bike tourism is, uh, is certainly inspiring uh, because uh, it can be a form of uh, slow tourism, so a responsible and uh, respectful way of making tourism. But uh, of course, it uh, it depends uh, on the level, uh, and so on. it depends on how trails are managed, are monitored, and uh, and also it depends on the uh, on the level of, uh, of awareness and uh, sensitivity of, uh, of bikers and uh, all the operators. So how they they, uh, they want to approach uh, to to nature and in, in general to the to the ecosystem. So thank you, thank you. Of course, all questions at the uh, at the end. Um, and uh, um, in the meantime, welcome to the to the participants who have joined us. Uh, in the meantime, and I remind you that uh, you can type uh, your questions in, uh, in chat or in the in the Q and A section. Um, and uh, feel free. To, to interact in, uh, in the chat in order to, to stimulate the, the discussion. So um, let's move to the, uh, to the second speaker. So uh, from Austria to Germany. And so uh, Lars, uh, Lars Korn from the Southeast Rügen Biosphere Reserve. And so Lars, the floor is, uh, is yours and uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um... I also like to welcome you all to the today's webinar. I will go straight to my presentation. Is it working? Yeah. All right. I will talk about the uh, balance of the needs of tourism, agriculture, and also nature conservation in our biosphere reserve. I will give a brief introduction first of our area, later on talk about some problems and how we try to solve them or how we probably in some case solved them already. And I give a brief introduction of one special case in one area of our biosphere reserve, the Zika, Zika, well, we call it the Zika mountain area, but I think for our colleagues from, for example, Austria, it's, it, it wouldn't be a mountain <laughs> at all. Um, our area is 22,800 hectares big. It's a, quite a small, small biosphere reserve. And we have 17,000 inhabitants. We are located in the northern part of Germany on Germany's biggest island, the island of Rügen. And our biosphere reserve is one of the core touristic areas within Germany. We have an employment share of about 75% in tourism, and we have about 4.5 million overnight stays by year. The last two years it was less, but I think it's related to the Corona crisis before. But the problem is not all people travel to our place cause of our biosphere reserve. They mainly come cause we have nice beaches on the Baltic sea coast. Our 
key actors or stakeholders are the tourism, as I mentioned. We have many agricultural areas. We still have a few fisheries, but it's decreasing actually. And of course, our part is also the conservation within that area. I, and related to all that tourism pressure, of course, we also have some problems within our area. We have high visitor pressure within our area. We have a high pressure on investments in construction investments in our area, so that locals are often not more able to buy a house or something like that. Of course, the pressure from outside from investors is too high. We have high traffic densities within the summer months, especially. And due to all those problems, of course, we also have a loss of regional identity. There on the map, you can see our area with the different zones. And even our biosphere reserve is quite small. Our area is still really diverse. We have uh, the town of Putbus, which was built from, by one prince in 1800 by some classicistic style. And we have the nice bay, uh, the nice bay areas with the Sika Mountains, as I said before. We have our agricultural landscape. We have some nice beach forest areas. And we have those touristic hotspots within the Baltic Sea Coast area. Those are mainly the town of Plint, which is the core area. It's a bit outside of the biosphere reserve, or actually, but we also have the village of Sedin, Babe, and Gurn, where all the tourists usually, usually stay. And with all those problems, we tried, we discussed how to get some solutions to solve them. And the umbrella organization of the protected areas in Europe, the Europark Federation, developed one certification as charter park for sustainable tourism in protected areas. It is related to the targets of the Agenda 21. And we decided to go through that certification process. It includes a um, stakeholder process where we were actually searching solutions together with stakeholders, with all the, with the majors of the towns and with the farmers and so on. And within that process, we actually developed some solutions and some of the solutions, of course, are all also in use somehow. We have one partner initiative with about 27 partners right now already. And within that initiative, we have different companies, for example, beekeepers, farmers, but also some industrial, industrial companies or also, for, of course, tourism companies. And those partners are actually their important supporters for us in that area to go through that development to be more sustainable. And they are also important ambassadors for us. But the aim of the partner initiative is, of course, also to increase the local income of those companies. We need to solve the traffic problem somehow. We invented one tourist tax finance transport, first with a bus, but from the year 21 also with ships within the biosphere reserve area. And this system is actually working really well, especially with the ships, because the tourists, uh, for them, it's an um, event to use, uh, to use the ships within the area for transport. But all in all, it's just a small solution for now. We have so many people and so many traffic that the shift itself can't be the can't be the main solution. We are working on environmental education because, uh, of course, if the children will understand our targets and they and they will understand the natural relationships, 
they will be important supporters in the future. We invented some series of events to support the marketing of regional products, to give our partners some platform to sell their products, but also to extend the tourist season to get more sea tourists actually in the spring and in the autumn, but not especially in the summer where we have plenty already anyway. And now I will get to my yeah, special case. We have the Tika Peninsula or also the Tika Mountains, as we call it. It's a nature reserve in our place with 933 hectares. It consists of um, some poor zone, but also the main area is buffer zone. And we have in this area nutrient poor grasslands which are really rich in flowers and so on. And this landscape, actually it's not natural. We would have some beach forest there and if it's a natural case, but it was developed by grazing sheep. And we wanted to keep it like that, of course. And we also had some other problems like people were leaving the path we had erosion through illegal use of bicycles, especially nowadays, and there are e-bikes, so everybody can especially actually has the power to drive around there with a bicycle. We had some issues with drone flights and with litter, littering, and also that the bushes were encroaching. We got one farmer to keep his sheep there. He has about 700 sheep now in that area. And he's using one traditional sheep breed for the landscape management. He's also mm, getting his own feed stuffs from, that landscape, from the land around, mm, organic feed stuffs. And the local wool is used for clothing and there's also a beekeeper within that farm to produce high quality honey within that area. We worked on our visitor management. We developed one audio guide, which is taken by the visitors really well. But we also made some visitor surveys to check where the problem actually is. We got some visitor counting devices so we could control where how many visitors we actually have within that area. And we offer we are offering guided hikes now for for the visitors within within that area with our rangers, but we also have some nature guides working within that area. We have volunteer nature conservation wardens now. And we invented some public garbage collection campaigns for the people. That is actually what we uh, what we did in that area, and it worked quite well. I think it's a good example for our area where we could solve our problems within one small part. And of course, we are still having some yeah problems or targets. In the future, we are still working on increasing our organic agricultural area. There, the farms in our area, they are really big with about 400 to more than 1,000 hectares. And those farmers are not easy to be convinced to work on organic agriculture. We are still trying to figure in more public transport solutions we are still on inventing some bike and hiking tourism offers. We just two weeks ago opened another audio guide within another area. We are searching for solutions for less car traffic. There's even some ideas about making the biosphere reserve car free, but it's but that wouldn't be an easy process for now. And another important point for us, I did not talk about it earlier, but we are still having some fisheries and 
they're decreasing. So we are trying to support small local fisheries within our area. So that's that's it from my side. Thank you. And yeah, I would like to give back to Erica if there's it's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lars. Also, also this case from the Southeast Yugen uh, Biosphere Reserve gave us uh, some, some very stimulating suggestions and, uh, uh, and inputs. Uh, this biosphere reserve is, uh, is a very popular tourist destination in Germany. And, uh, and of course, this brings a lot of uh, issue about uh, pressure in this uh, uh, particular natural uh, area. So, uh, and of course, uh, in addition to tourism, there is also another important activity that is, um, that is agriculture. So uh, for ensuring preservation and, uh, and the good management of the biosphere reserve, there is the need to, to take into account different uh, land use and different uh, users and, uh, and interest uh, and stakeholders. Um, but I think that uh, the, the, the process for, uh, uh, for reaching the European Charter um, of Sustainable Tourism in Natural Park is, uh, is very important for, uh, for stimulating uh, sustainable uh, development uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this area and in the Biosphere Reserve. So, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Of course, if there are uh, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to interact in uh, uh, in the chat. You can uh, type your your questions, and uh, uh, you are perfectly on time. So, uh, so we can uh, move to the to the last um, the last speaker. So from. Austria, Germany, and uh, finally to uh, in England, uh, we have uh, Andrew Bell from uh, in the North Devon uh, Biosphere Reserve. So, Andrew, <laughs> the floor is yours. So, for you, twenty minutes. Thank you. Just to unmute, and I'll uh, share my screen. So, um, buonasera tutti, and um, good Abend. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, the invitation to uh, share the floor with uh, what I discovered now are two other forester colleagues. So it's obviously a profession that which can uh, influence the world. So if anybody wants a career in forestry, you know where, where the, the good stuff lies. So um, what I wanted to talk about uh, this evening is how we've addressed the problem of, um, we've called it over tourism. Or it, it's a concept that has been known as, uh, now known as over tourism. Um, which is happening everywhere, but um, we were doing this with a, a, an interreg program, which I'll describe in a second. But first, I'll give you an introduction to uh, the North Devon area. So this is the southwest of England. So it's this leg that sort of hangs out the southwest of England. And this is the Biosphere Reserve area here, which includes all the land that drains to the North Devon coast. And then we actually go into the marine area to 12 nautical miles around our coastline, including the island of Lundy. And, um, and that's basically sort of river catchments. So it's, it's, it's based on that. Our core area is a big dune system right down at the estuary mouth there. But because it's part of the estuary, that's why we decided that all the rivers draining into that area are part of the, uh, the transition zone. And in future, we are looking at uh, configuring the, the area a little bit differently with having multiple core zones and these would include the marine sites around Lundy, which is one of the first marine reserves in the UK, and also the, the high areas of Dartmoor and Exmoor, where it's, it's peat highlands, and then some of the coastal areas where we have these special oak forests, the Atlantic Oakland forest, which, you know, like our rainforest, effectively. But uh, we've got a few images now about what our landscape actually looks like. So this is our large dune system. It's one of the largest second largest dune system in the UK, one of the largest in Europe, but um, it's uh, a massive dune system that's got 470 species, plant species, and has most, about three quarters of the UK's butterfly species recorded there. So it's, it is a biodiverse rich area indeed. And as I say, that is our core area of the Biosphere Reserve. Um, then we have areas dotted around, this is on Exmoor National Park, where Again, it's the, the very steep valley sides are covered in within uh, our special Atlantic oak forests, um, but also they stretch up to the high peatlands, but then down to the marine areas as well. 
and again where the rivers come up from the sea or if you like going the other way around we're going at the top end of the estuaries into the river island environment into sort of mixed farmland and woodland areas that um, are really quite picturesque but not always explored and this is the, the mouth of our estuary looking out to sea and we never forget the marine life underneath and this is the sunset cup coral which is a special kind of soft water coral and this is at the northern edge of its limit around our marine sort of areas particularly around the island of Lundy where this can be found so this is one of our special indicator species and then we have some other really sort of um, rare ones as well um, particularly rare for the UK this is the freshwater pearl mussel so this is the bivalve which um, lives for about 100 years in its natural life um, and in that time it can produce pearls um, and what we've discovered about the pearl mussels in our uh, rivers is that um, they're genetically distinct from the rest of the UK. These ones are more related to the kind of pearl mussels you'll find in France and Spain. So we've got a very sort of, in terms of UK, very distinct population there which um, is worthy of conservation. And then back on the fishery side, uh, we have in a small village right on the coast, we have a very traditional fishery for herring. And what we've discovered with our research in the last couple of years is that the herring in the coming to this village are again genetically distinct from the rest of the herring in the, in the Bristol Channel in the sea around it. Well, certainly there's a population that comes in earlier into this particular village that is different from the rest. Some of the rest also come in as well, but at a slightly different time. So just with a few kind of small investigations, we discovered that you know, North Devon does have its, its own gene genetic special resources that uh, are worthy of conservation, but also part of that cultural history of the, uh, the area. So just sort of think about uh, the, the problem of over-tourism and, and this on the most popular beaches in uh, the UK is what it can be like, super crowded, um, we got, you can see there on the left hand side, that's the traffic going down to one of our beaches in North Devon. And it's very similar to these other ones in Dorset and Brighton, which Brighton is another bicycle reserve that we work with. And you can see that, you know, there is this mass pressure coming in from um, all the hinterland in the UK. People want to come down to the southwest for holidays, and it is the beach and the sea that is the big attractor. And that leads to that problem of overpressure on those coastal environments, those marine environments. So it's understanding that kind of pressure, and, and that's been a concept that's um, that's been explored and, and identified in other places. You know, whether you're going to Thailand or whether it's um, looking at uh, some of the galleries in Florence, or if it's um, and I think uh, last mentioned about some of the over tourism that happens within uh, Rugen as well. And you know, it's not a phenomenon that's unique to to North Devon. So it does happen everywhere else. And so to to deal with this particular problem, we um, partnered up with three other biosphere reserves and joined in an interreg project, which we gave it the un, um, unattractive title, I think was the way I would best described as biocultural heritage tourism. And we, we just had, a, I was explaining the idea that we wanted with the, our French colleagues. And so, you know, this is, this is the sort of thing I'm talking about. It's not the title I would actually give it. It's not the thing that's going to attract people or make it sort of work, be, as a, as a tool, it's, it's, it's about bio being about what is the, the living resource that we have, what's the, you know, the, the genetic resource, what is the wildlife and nature we have. Culture is what is the, the practices and the traditions that have created that space that allows that biodiversity to exist and thrive. And obviously the heritage of the tourism is, is, is part of the, the attractor that makes it all work together. So the, the very unpretty title, the ugly title of BCHT actually stuck. We like to call it something else. It is just a nature tourism um, and a nature and culture tourism, but it's, um, it is, it is, yeah, it is that. So the, the project was um, devised by us and worked with uh, the Marie de de Marois, just behind uh, Calais in France, Brighton and Lewis Downs, which is now called the Living Coast Biosphere Reserve, and the Mer d'Ile de Iroise, which is the, uh, the Ocean Dials, just off the end of Brittany in France, and of course ourselves. And it was a 4.3 million uh, euro programme going from April 2018, and it's just completed in March 2022. 
And it, really, sort of the, the, the thrust of the call we were asking, well, answering to from Interreg was how to achieve growth in tourism without causing environmental harm. And it was, we thought we'd actually started developing tools here that could be used by other protected area spaces and other biosphere reserves that would help them to manage tourism growth and management without um, you know, getting that economic gain, without actually damaging the, the very resource that, that uh, people have come to see. And it, um, we, you know, we do have that evidence very much in the UK that at least 80% of the visits to our biosphere reserve are stimulated by the environment and environmental features. So we know that people are coming to see those things, but what we also recognize as well is that many people are making that real connection with that environment. So our aim with this one is to say, well, how do we create a, a product that means that we can actually reconnect people with that environment and create a sector within that tourism industry that actually helps regenerate that environment. So it's actually restorative rather than exploitative. And it means that we also have visitors who will actually come and respect and understand that environment and sort of be, are willing to be part of it and restore it. Um, and what we've discovered, you know, during the, certainly through the last two years with COVID is, and I must apologise to every other resort that uh, British people go to, is that they seem to be incredibly badly behaved as tourists. They just really are dreadful sometimes at respecting the environment, even though they say that they come here and they love it. Um, they just don't really love it because, you know, they don't really respect it. So we have an uphill job there in trying to sort of make that work. So what we wanted to do with this one is to try and create those activities which will help people be in touch with that uh, environment, that wildlife or whatever, or that culture, so that they could respect it and they could understand it more. And then that would lead to a better tourism relationship and hopefully a restorative impact, which then meant, you know, we could have tourism growth that didn't harm the environment. So one of the, the first work packages we had within the programme was to develop a master planning tool. So the idea of this was we looked at where all the tourists were visiting, um, looked at the sensitivity of those sites to that tourism pressure and looked at sort of basically we had a heat map of where the problems were happening. And we sort of then looked at where there were sort of different ideas and opportunities based on this idea of biocultural heritage tourism. Where could we improve the management of those sites and or where could we displace visitors to to give them a better experience or, or as good an experience which then meant they were more connected to the environment so it's a way of just displacing the pressure and spreading it out um, and how could we best do that so we looked at all the different um, data layers we had where is the biodiversity where is that biocultural heritage that people come to see um, it's not just on the coast it's spread right across the whole biosphere reserve so we mapped all that out. We looked at all the biodiversity records we had. We looked at uh, where the tourism pressure is, where the tourism infrastructure is, where the travel infrastructure is, where there are businesses, because we recognize that um, you can create new businesses where there already are small clusters. So there's a kind of a mutual support. And uh, we looked at those sort of things in public transport, et cetera. So we gathered all that data, we put it into several different layers and we stack it into the maps and this sort of thing. And then we asked, several experts to give the scoring for the sites on their pressure and their sensitivity. So that was all put into the, the matrix of the, the algorithm that makes the GIS model. We asked a few experts to say, if you were gonna develop um, an alternative activity like BCHT somewhere, where would you do it? So we had then expert opinion layers built into the program. So having stacked all these things up, we then looked at what we did it was a statistical tool called stepwise regression. And we looked at what is it, what were the factors that really drove the creation of these ideas or sites where experts said it would be a good idea, idea to do this in this location, which then gave us a whole list of factors that led up to where we could actually do this elsewhere, which then led to these heat maps, which I'll display in a second. So there we were sort of putting in together the, the existing GIS data and inputs we had. So it's really sort of relying on good data you can get hold of. What were the tourism factors? So what were the things that people were particularly interested in? What, what did they like to see? What were their drivers for coming into the area? What local planning policies and priorities um, around the area were supporting or working against this idea of uh, developing and extending tourism? 
different stakeholder inputs from different NGOs, et cetera, about what they felt the benefits were and where they could be applied. We looked at seasonality scores because sometimes some habitats are more sensitive in winter or in summer, depending on whether it's nesting birds or the wintering birds, for example. And then we also applied different scenarios of future development. So whether it was business as usual, um, business without constraints, or business taking a more stewardship and careful approach that was more sympathetic to the environment. And then we've put out two major outputs, which were the, the pressure maps. So where is where are the problems occurring and where they're going to get worse? And opportunity maps saying where can we address and put in sort of more tourism um, opportunities that will actually help to restore and deflect some of the pressure off, off the more sensitive sites. And um, again, we applied into different layers there. Um, also different policies that we could apply. So if we increased the amount of um, sustainable transport links into these areas, how would that change those pressures and opportunities? So that was all built into the, the, the GIS tool that we made. And, you know, so like I said, there were the scenarios looking at business as usual, which um, would mean essentially there was more pressure gonna be happen and probably some slightly less opportunities arising. Um, no control, so that's business without constraints, you know, world um, trade rules, etc. So which meant to, you know, there'd be an awful lot more pressure. Um, and that would probably sort of, people would be looking for less opportunities to do things elsewhere. And then the sustainable tourism or the stu stewardship approach of saying, well, we'll actually sort of deal with less pressure, but actually sort of create more opportunities was, was really what the, the main outcomes were. So applying those into the, the model and then sort of coming out with the maps. So the map mapping of the pressures so the baseline there, you can see that we have this massive pressure around the coastline around there, which is um, where people come for the surfing, for example, and sitting on the beach. So the surfing industry is worth to North Devon about 55 million pounds a year. So it is a massive attractor um, and surfing you could hope is more innocuous, but if you, then you get some of the, the more mass tourism, which then is more hotels and things and more cars, then that's the sort of thing that gives us a problem. So you can see we have these, these big pressures along here, along some very sensitive sites. Um, so looking to the future, you know, we get um, the, the, the business as usual, and you can see that that pressure just kind of increases a little bit around those areas. And you see we're getting, even some of these sites, we're getting more pressure. Unregulated, um, you know, that it's very much similar to business as usual, probably a little bit more pressure sites coming on. So, you know, the things happening that even in some of these sensitive sites down here, where you think actually it's not very good. So taking a more responsible approach, we can spread some of those pressures and it reduces pressure on the coastline. And there's not too much pressure in that way because we've changed the attitude of the business and how it works with the environment. So it's just making it much more sympathetic. And if we look at the, the opportunity side, which is really where we wanted to focus um, future development, is saying that um, you know, we, we, the result is, you know, there's the baseline and this is the business as usual. And you can see there's, you know, there's a few more opportunities being created there. Under the um, no constraints, again, opportunities are not arising because people aren't looking for them. They're just focusing on those very iconic places where the, the tourists come and um, ruin the place to an extent. But then if you have the custodianship, you can see that it starts creating opportunities all over the place um, with much more intensity. So in terms of the, the total value of tourism arising from that custodianship approach is much higher and is far less damaging than the other two scenarios. Unfortunately, our stakeholders have said, yes, they now recognize that the stewardship approach or sustainable tourism is the way to go. And so we're using these plans and these, um, these outputs and this um, process to now get it embedded into the regional planning for the local authorities. So it now becomes actually a, a policy, not just a concept that we've derived through uh, an interreg project. So it is a transferable tool. So you can download um, the module and see how it works and everything from GitHub, which is where, you know, we tend to store free, free open source code for particularly for, for GIS. So that's available there. 
another outcome that came from the uh, mapping was we created an app because what we recognized was we need to be able to quickly get people to respond to changes in the pressures of the environment. And so what we have done with the app is looked at all those different places and those activities we can generate that are new and different and make people aware of those with this app that goes onto your mobile phone. At the same time, we've included in there weather conditions, tidal conditions and road conditions and access to um, public transport information, et cetera. So you can sort of say, well, you're here in this particular place. It's already full at the beach. So you don't want to have that overcrowded experience on the beach. You might want to try something else. And you can select from this um, different themes that you might want to do. You might want to go for a walk. You might want to look for a walk that does things around biodiversity. Or you might want to do something that's more about history and culture. You might want to go for an experience which is more about woodlands. You might want to have an experience which is more about traditional agriculture in their grasslands or something like that. So it gives all those different opportunities there that you can filter out and look at the things that you want to do. And then these, the road lines here are from uh, the Google app, which then tells you how much traffic is on those roads. So you can say, well, actually, there's going to be a traffic jam if I go that way. But if I go this way, I can avoid the traffic and I can have a nice time and have a nice meal at this pub, whatever that uh, that, that permits. So it, this is just being launched now. Um, so that's called the North Devon Explorer. So if you wanted to um, go to that website, you'll get straight into the app. And, and again, sort of part of our program as well was, was just creating those new products and those new activities in different areas. So these were sort of done with um, new activity days done, for example, at some of the small environmental interpretation centres dotted around the Biosphere Reserve. On the island of Lundy, we supplied uh, the island team with training to be snorkel leaders so they actually sort of could then train tourists to go on guided snorkels underneath the water to actually give that sort of more in-depth experience so they've actually sort of said it's not just paddling around at the edge but it means they could actually see the wildlife and biodiversity and respect it and again sort of interpretation opportunities up along in the national park there as well and there's some of the other activities that we had developed as well so looking at the woodland tourism, which I was very keen on, was uh, how we can bring more woodlands back into management. Um, so we bought a mobile charcoal retort or charcoal kiln, which we can take to a woodland and there we can, people can come and help make charcoal. So they spend a day cutting a bit of wood, but then there's some wood that's been stored there already, that goes into the kiln, that gets cooked inside the kiln for a day, and it's charcoal brought out at the end of it. So they, at the end of the, the following day, they can go home with their bag of charcoal to put in their barbecue. And so they're feeling really good because they can cook their own venison that was might, might have been shot in the forest or whatever that's barbecued on their own charcoal barbecue and feel good about it. And meanwhile, we've actually got that woodland back into management at the same time, which is a double win. And then so we backed all this up with um, a new network business charter. So we've um, working with our French colleagues as well. So they developed these um, eco charters for the business. It's a bit like the, um, the Europark one that, that Lars mentioned. So this is where it's based on the, the Biosphere Reserve's functions and, and the strategy for the Biosphere Reserve. So we know that they sign up to those things, what they're going to report on. But again, to make it um, more of a network and not so much a policing thing is that it's peer-to-peer -peer accredited. So the businesses will actually look and support each other in how they develop their um, their accreditation and their activities and develop and promote and one of the things they do is, as well is to support a visit invest and protect program which is not quite the tourism tax that the last mentioned um, but it, it is more of a way to encourage the businesses and the visitors to enjoy the spaces they've been to but once they've sort of had that enjoyment is to say well actually i think that's good i, I want to uh, contrib contribute financially to its maintenance and then they can do that through the program so we started off you know with a target of wanting to get sort of 20 or 30 businesses in but it's been really successful and just within a year we have 70 businesses recruited so it's early days um, but it is something that it still continues to grow so with that I'll uh, leave it and uh, leave it for questions so thank you very much
So thank you so much, Andrew, for a, for a very notable presentation. Um, we saw in your presentation uh, some images about uh, tourist flows uh, uh, along, um, along the coast uh, in, uh, in these last two summers. And I think it's very interesting that uh, COVID-19 has, uh, has caused the decline of tourists in many popular tourist destinations uh, uh, in the world, but at the same time, uh, it has increased the number of visitors and of course their pressure uh, in other areas uh, such as uh, Devon. So uh, I think this is uh, uh, this, uh, this bring uh, uh, new and also maybe unexpected uh, issues to be, uh, to be managed. And, uh, so I'm very appreciative that the, uh, the use of the GIS uh, model you know, so in developing these three scenarios that I think uh, are very important to better understand uh, how to, to develop carry capacity and also how to distribute uh, tourist, uh, tourist flow. So um, thank you very much to all, uh, to all speakers. So we, we have concluded this first uh, round and uh, I think that um, many interesting points and uh, suggestions for discussion uh, have, uh, have emerged from these uh, three cases, from these uh, uh, three biosphere uh, reserves. For example, the need uh, to better distribute uh, visitor flows, uh, and also to, to promote, uh, to develop more, uh, more responsible tourist products uh, and in general, uh, more sustainable economic uh, activities. And also the need to, to, to educate and also uh, make uh, all users of the uh, biosphere reserves uh, uh, more aware. So residents, uh, tourists, uh, and in general visitors, the companies, the tourist operators, um, I think that, this is uh, the, the education and making them aware of being in, in a biosphere reserve uh, is, uh, is, of course, a very important uh, topic in, in managing uh, carrying capacity and in general the development of, uh, of all the area. So uh, I wish, of course, the participants to, to pose, uh, uh, I wish to invite participants to pose questions in, uh, in chat uh, and uh, I see that uh, there, are, uh, there are some questions for all, for, for all three speakers. Uh, so um, I think we can start with, uh, uh, with these questions in order to, to stimulate the, uh, the discussion. So the first one uh, is... Uh, so the first one that I saw... Sorry. Also, the first one by, uh, by Eva uh, Cardona um, for, uh, um, for Lars, uh, um, so for the South, uh, Southeast Rugen Biosphere Reserve. So, uh, is there a limit of touristic places? Uh, in, uh, in Southeast Julian Biosphere Reserves and also uh, for LAPS, uh, why fishery is, uh, is decreasing? Yes, this is a, a very interesting question. Why fishery is decreases? So this, uh, the, the, these two questions for, uh, for LAPS. All right, all right. I think with the first questions, you are referring to the construction of new hotels, for example, if there's a limit for like touristic places like hotels like, or other touristic infrastructure. Um, as a South East Rugen Biosphere Reserve is uh, the Nature Protection Authority of the um, Mecklenburg Vorpommern province and Germany, but we are mainly in control of the core zones and buffer zones. And within the villages, for example, we are not really in control of the construction there. The village municipality has to, has to actually decide if they want some new hotels or if they don't want. And in the past, mostly they decided to build more because they hope for more touristic tax, they hope for more income, for more work to do. 
but um, many of those investors, they don't have their seat within our area. They, so the money actually is going to other places. And I think now they're starting to think, hang, think to limit it within their areas, but it's not really, it's not really within our control. And about the fish, fisheries, I think it has different reasons. One reason, of course, is that to be a fisherman is a rough job. So young people don't really want to become fishermen anymore. And another core reason now is that the main fish, the herring, is not really available in our area anymore. In the past, they, they all, always had a lot of fish to catch, but now the herring almost disappeared. And the reason for that, for that problem is within the, within the climate change, actually. Uh, I'm, I'm not a marine specialist, but it's like that the herring is controlled by the water temperature to go to our bay areas to leave their eggs. Then the herring larves will, will grow and they, they are supposed to eat zooplankton. And the zooplankton in that case is controlled by the light. So it does not fit together anymore somehow in that case. So the larves are dying actually because they have nothing, nothing to eat now. And every year the, the quota rules for how much the fishermen can take, they are negotiated by the EU Council and they got shortened by over 90% last year. They got shortened the last years already always, but now they're shortened for more than 90% of the fishermen are also not allowed to catch that much anymore actually. And there are actually different kinds of fishermen we have. We had the fishermen who always just went fishing and they saw their, saw their, their fish to the fish factories for really low prices. And the fish got canned and sold all over the world, actually. And there's um, other guys who, who actually, they are surviving for now, but they're doing direct marketing. For example, the fisherman has a small restaurant itself. So he's getting more value out of the fish. He's selling it to the tourists. And so he's, he's still even able to make his living even with that low quota within the area but yeah for for some of them it's it's hard now and science it got shortened that much it's it's also getting hard for for people who even are selling the fish themselves and there's also the problem that of course the tourists are coming here and they're thinking of course i'm on the I'm on the coast, of course, the fish in the restaurant should be from, from here, but nowadays it's it's not like that actually anymore. Some restaurants who take care of regional product, they say regional fish, but most of the restaurants actually they the imported fish. Because it's cheaper and it's more effort to go to the fishermen to buy the fish and so on. Okay. Okay, thank you, Lars. Thank you. And um, thank you also, uh, Eva, for proposing this, uh, uh, this question. And also to uh, Yara Maria Chagas de Carvalho, sorry for the pronunciation, um, because of course it is a very interesting question. Uh, the reason why uh, some activities uh, that were important in the past uh, suffered a decline. Uh, so um, how also uh, it is possible to, uh, to, to, to implement, to, to stimulate the, and support this, uh, this activity that I think that are important for the identity and also in, from a culture, from a social cultural point of view uh, for, the, uh, for the area. 
Um, we have also a question uh, by Yara Maria Shagans de Carvalho, so uh, thank you. And a question for, uh, um, for Harold. And uh, um, in particular, Harold talked about uh, bike tourism and mountain bike tourism, but uh, um, Yara Maria um, asked uh, what other touristic activities are there in the biosphere reserve in Vinopod? Well, um, to be honest, um, it's it's pretty hard with tourism here in the Biosphere Reserve Vinavard because uh, if you have a look at the map and you will uh, immediately realize that Austria ain't that big country, right? So people coming for tourism proposes to Austria, they basically go to mo a more western part of Austria due to skiing and hiking, basically want to see the Alps or going to Salzburg, or they uh, prefer the cultural aspect and then they mainly go to Vienna, the city center of Vienna, uh, to see the, yeah, the city center and Schönbrunn and uh, those kinds of things uh, related to, to Vienna. And um, this is ain't a part of the Biosphere Reserve uh, since we are stretching from the Western part of Vienna uh, going to Lower Austria. So to my point of view, and um, may I have to point out that I'm not a tourism expert, uh, yeah, the Wienerwald is uh, highly valued uh, as, a, uh, as a recreational area, so where uh, people from Vienna, from Lower Austria, just uh, go in the forest for hiking, mountain biking, horseback riding, stuff like that. Uh, and uh, when it comes to tourism, then it's uh, mainly seminar tourism. Uh, I hope that's the, the right uh, word and or translated to English where like uh, companies go for team building events for uh, just having their annual meeting to discuss things to find their uh, business strategies uh, those kind of uh, tourism aspects are also I would say pretty um, pretty famous or carried out in the Wienerwald and uh, we're trying to develop uh, tourism products and uh, come up with some more ideas like uh, the e-biking I mentioned. This was the first uh, uh, thing we were uh, trying uh, to work on and to develop. And another idea uh, which we are, uh, yeah, more or less working on these days or the Minerva tourism uh, is mainly uh, trying to develop is uh, due to the fact that also from the Minerva Biosphere Reserve, due to data about uh, 60 to 70 percent of the area is forest to come up with uh, forest related products. So just to uh, provide things like hikes in the forest uh, combined with um, like also taste of forest, uh, uh, or wealth, uh, um, yeah, feeling uh, health issues outside in the forest, those kind of things. Uh, but uh, we, we ain't have that, um, so to say, special attractions maybe uh, uh, attracting many, many people and therefore may have a, a little bit of different uh, situation than it's, uh, uh, it was uh, pointed out in North Devon or uh, Southeast Rügen. I hope this uh, answers the, the, the question properly. Otherwise, please just uh, add another comment. Thank you, Harald. Um, Harald, you have a question. And, uh, um, we have uh, we have some questions for uh, Andrew Andrew Bell. Um, questions uh, a question from uh, Yara Maria. So <laughs> thank you again. And uh, in particular, um, she um, she don't understand the difference uh, uh, between business as usual and no control when you uh, talk about uh, the, the the different scenario. And. Uh, um, and also, uh, she uh, she asked, uh, do you have any measure about the decrease of population in the most pressure areas, and uh, how do you evaluate your effort to create a better behavior on uh, on tourists? Yeah, that's uh, thanks for the question. Um, the business as usual just assumes that the business and the municipal authorities are going to continue in the way that they are. So we know that a lot of businesses believe that you know there is has to be some controls and the local authorities apply some of the controls but they're not always the best not best applied which is why we have these particular problems so the business as usual says things will go on as they are which means there will be some kind of increase in pressure but it's not going to be regulated very strongly but it'll be it'll be some regulation there the the business without constraints is literally just saying 
come and make your money out of tourism, do what you like, you know, to the businesses. So they'll come down and build hotels and everything. Now there won't be any kind of regulation to it. They'll just sort of try and maximize the tourism. So it just becomes a mass tourism kind of industry that would, that, that would happen. It would all focus on those iconic areas like the, the national parks and the, the coastal strip. So that's the difference between those two. So one is a mild or a, or a kind of steady, but not particularly enlightened regulation going on. The one is just no regulation whatsoever compared to the sustainable one, which has its, its attitudes and policies are much more geared towards sustainability. And in terms of measuring that, yes, the um, measuring the impacts of our work, it's, it's early days, but you know, during that interreg program, we established baselines um, with questionnaires, visitor questionnaires and surveys and numbers, because now it's quite easy to measure the number of visitors coming to a place because of automatic um, number plate recognition on car parks, for example. And um, again, sort of traffic monitoring as well. So we can actually see changes in behavior right across the whole thing in terms of absolute numbers. And of course, there's always the traditional sort of numbers of returns and hotel bed nights that are recorded as well. Um, in terms of changes in behavior and attitudes, then it's really sort of keeping a track on what problems are arising uh, because of that pressure. So whether it is footpath erosion on the dunes, for example, or in the coastal areas, if it is um, some of the other sort of problems of over tourism where it's just overcrowding or there's, there's some kind of social unease or dis, uh, unrest because there are too many people um, coming into the village. The national policies are changing some of that. So, for example, as some of the coastal villages, um, you know, they've got a very high um, second home occupancy. So in other words, you've got people from outside the, outside the area owning lots of houses within that village, up to about 34%, 30 or 40%. And Olaf Lars could probably tell us that uh, in Rugen, it's probably an awful lot higher in some of those villages, because I saw that a few weeks ago when we went to, to Vilm, but um, it, it is typical of, of those kind of things. So we, we can monitor those, and those policies are starting to change, and we can look at those impacts in that particular way. So it is monitoring the actual problem itself. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for your answer. And uh, mm, there is also um, a question again to uh, to to Errol, to Errol Brenner. And um, Oksana asked, uh, um, you mentioned uh, that, uh, that the, the, the Binnerval Biosphere Reserve uh, uh, is developing uh, mountain bike tourism. Um, but uh, uh, do you place any type or limits uh, on this development uh, uh, or and uh, what uh, uh, or how we manage large flows of yeah. tourists? Uh, so, uh, of course, this is a question very linked to, to the concept of carrying capacity and of, of uh, limitation in, in tourist flows. Yeah, sure. We, we were thinking about this as well. Uh, but right now we're more or less uh, starting to get evaluate data and start with projects in uh, trying to start counting visitors right now and uh, bikers being out since uh, also the impression you get if you talk to like the local forest manager it's uh there are high differences for someone working pretty close to vienna uh it's it's a completely different situation than for someone being uh, located more in the western part of uh, the biosphere reserve so what we are trying to do and what we are focusing on uh, right now is to start a monitoring to get better impression and ideas, data of uh, how many people are there actually right, actually in the forests right now with their bikes. And for sure, we're trying to uh, to develop uh, the tourism aspects and the, our projects um, close to the uh, city center, uh, or, or not too close to the city, close to the city where it's uh, also uh, easier uh, to combine uh, those kind of new um, new packages, so to say, with already existing uh, possibilities. And uh, therefore, uh, we, we, we don't uh, think that we will uh, face any serious troubles, but for sure, uh, we will have to, to consider and work on that if we realize that it's uh, really becoming like a mass tourism uh, on mountain bikes within the area.
thank you. And uh, mm, this, uh, um, this was the last question, but uh, of course, uh, feel free to, uh, to, 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 uh, to type also other questions, also other comments. Uh, uh, and uh, um, we have uh, some, some minutes. Uh, so I have a question, oh, so to end you, to end you again. Okay, so this is a very important question and also a, my, um, a question that uh, I would like to, uh, to, to pose to, to our speakers. And um, so do you, um, so you, um, your estimates of caring capacity and to expression come from experts opinion, but uh, uh, how did you account for, uh, for other stakeholders? Yeah, thank you for that question. It, it is a good one. Yes. Yeah. So initially, when we were doing the model, we were looking at the how to populate that layer that goes into the GIS model using expert opinion. Um, so we, we cycled it around several experts independently, kind of a couple of times. Um, so it's more like a Delphi technique to try and sort of build some kind of consensus of what that uh, that pressure is. But um, and then we sort of ran those models to see what it was like. But what we did as well, we took a sense check with the tourism stakeholders as well because you know to see if they felt it was it was a fair assumption about some of the pressures and the damages that were being done and, it, and that was an exercise in itself was good awareness raising in, in a way to engage those stakeholders at the same time so um, they started to realize that there were some problems that were being caused they were starting to look at what they felt the the scale might be and what the problems and the solutions were and Indeed, over the last few years, we've been working with them on those different ideas and solutions anyway. It wasn't all sort of done within that first three years of that uh, project. We, we had some history of working with them over the last 20 years as a biosphere reserve. But um, yes, it, it, we did sort of take that stakeholder opinion as well. But just by testing some of those results with them and seeing what they felt, we also did that with the local authorities. And it was, you know, having sort of done that and then taken on their ideas and refined it further, um, that it's now robust enough that the, the local authorities can use it and adopt it as a policy or a policy tool in their statutory land development plan. Thank you. Um, but, and uh, um, about the, the, the involvement and the engagement of uh, stakeholders, this is a question for all speakers because I think it's interesting that uh, in, in assessment, in the assessment and in the management of carrying capacity, uh, we have to, to take into account to consider different stakeholders and of course they are needs. So um, was it easy for, for you to, to involve uh, uh, stakeholders uh, in uh, in this sustainable path in this process, uh, or uh, did you encounter some some issues, uh, maybe with some categories of uh, of stakeholders? So uh, may I just go for uh, the Vinovard first? Um, I would say uh, mountain biking here is a quite emotional. Uh, issue. So basically, um, everyone claims to have a experience with mountain bikers, maybe a negative um, experience for a hiker being out with the family or with the dog, or also a, a biker who says I was just uh, riding my bike on a relaxed tour and someone just uh, blocked the road and I couldn't pass by. So it's, um, there's at least a, a high a potential for conflicts, I would say. Uh, so when we started and uh, made our uh, stakeholder workshops, where we invited um, pretty everyone from the provinces uh, we in, in one uh, project also to develop the guidelines and to discuss with the people, uh, we were pretty happy since the, since, uh, the, the the people joined and uh, came in to discuss and uh, also wrote up and showed us uh, which um, problems they do see, which uh, development they would uh, yeah, 
uh, respect and where they see problems or limits of, uh, of of the development when it comes to mountain biking tracks and trails. And I think um, that's um, quite important also for the Biosphere Reserve just to 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 open the process uh, to hear people. And but uh, that's also uh, the challenging part if you think about uh, the Wienerwald and 850,000 uh, inhabitants within the the region uh, just to to come up with a approaches everyone uh, could uh, be involved in or heard uh, to 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 also raise the voice and uh, just to be reflected but at least we tried i would say yes thank you and uh, the know lars or andrew i can say something about it um uh, referring to the example of the Zika mountains i was talking about before we we had a stakeholder process involved where we had workshops together with the land users and with the, with the villages around and so on. And we thought about the actions we could apply together together with the people. And when we, for example, developed those audio guides, we involved local people and also their knowledge about the area so they could they could include their knowledge within those audio guides. Okay. I'll just say very briefly about North Devon and because um, I have already talked about it. what we did find <laughs> was that during um, the pandemic, the destination management organization just suddenly kind of imploded. Um, because there wasn't any sort of tourism allowed during the lockdown and they just sort of didn't pick up and recover from that. So it was left to us to really engage with those businesses uh, and those groups where we could so that we didn't have an intermediary like a DMO to help us do that. So um, it, it was a little bit hard at first, but we did manage to sort of get out and reach to, reach to quite a large number of those stakeholders um, to work it through and into the process, as we said. But um, now hopefully we're working with the development of a new destination management organization. And I've said, I don't think the Biosphere Reserve should be the des des destination management organization. That is just too um, challenging for us to do. But we do want to be a big part of that DMO when it gets developed. So it, it's the whole program is meant we are in a, in a much better position in terms of our um, relationship with the tourism sector as a result of this. Yes, thank you, Andrew, and Andrew, and thank you, of course, all uh, all speakers. Uh, we have a um, a comment, and uh, in particular, Angelo Senici asked to, to to make a comment. So, uh, yes, feel free to to activate your microphone, and uh, <laughs> the floor is yours, Angelo. Okay, you hear me? Please, you can you hear also me? Uh, activate your. Uh, see, it's okay. Easy. <laughs> so, uh, thanks for the interesting exposition of the two speaker. I wanted to, to throw a little stone into the lake. In my, of course, this consideration will be not uh, enough uh, articulated for this, uh, for this issue because uh, need more time, but it, I think it's, uh, it's time to deal with it. Uh, in my opinion, it's, it's time to break a taboo for the outdoor community. Uh, it means the full and the free accessibility of outdoor sites. Uh, in few areas, I work as consultant uh, for developing uh, uh, tourist, outdoor tourist, sport outdoor tourist in different areas in Italy. And I realized that uh, in few areas, we are over the no, in many areas, not 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 few. Uh, means in a few in some area. Okay, we are we are over the uh, capacity, and this means that the impact on the natural and anthropic, more anthropic environment, is already too high. But also the experience for the practitioners will be fast degraded.
And it means that conflict with uh, local population arise and in an already in place, the conflicts. And in, in the next future, also the risk for tourism economy will be, uh, will be high because uh, our uh, practitioner, of course, uh, will believe we leave the, the area where the, the, the experience is so, will be so degraded. You cannot stay. You cannot stay uh, hour to wait to climb a line or to make a ferrata or to be or to be in a wide between a bracket area in in a line as in the supermarket. This is the risk that we saw every, in a lot of areas in this class. So, uh, in my experience now 30 years long, uh, I saw that uh, uh, self-limitation, self-regulation will not work. Uh, mainly because the practitioners are not, are not uh, uh, organization uh, with a strong leadership, and, and more and more now that uh, we have a new practitioner coming without experience, without no cultural background to, to outdoor. Uh, and also because also us, when we are in vacation, uh, we try to do all uh, to maximize our experience. And also with, uh, without uh, understanding their, their uh, what uh, we have around, uh, really what uh, the little uh, infraction that we do is can be higher multiplied for a lot of people. So I think it's time that uh, the subject that have uh, uh, in their hand management of uh, outdoor uh, area needed to deal with this uh, uh, new uh, approach. Of course, it. Of course, uh, with uh, all what we talk about, uh, education, uh, infrastructure, services, but without regulation limitation, I think cannot work. Uh, it's not, this was only to, something to think about and to, to talk about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angelo. And uh, uh, this is uh, a very significant and uh, uh, interesting observation. So of course, uh, I maybe uh, the issue is the, is the balance maybe between the, the different uh, um, caring capacities. So the environmental and physical caring capacity, but also the social cultural. So uh, of course, it's important to, the, the question is, how to balance the, the different uh, needs, uh, of course, the preservation uh, of nature and uh, uh, the, the, the importance to, to develop uh, economic uh, activity as, uh, as tourists, but of course, uh, in, a sustainable, uh, in a sustainable way. And also to, to, to consider the, the needs of, uh, of residents and of all people that, uh, um, that use that, uh, that area, that the biosphere uh, reserve. Uh, so I, I think that uh, time is, uh, is up now, so the, uh, we have a, a very um, significant discussion and uh, uh, I think that uh, I think these three cases, these three, um, these three uh, biosphere reserves uh, show that, uh, uh, that biosphere reserves can offer um, can offer us very valuable solutions uh, and ideas also to, to face these important challenges uh, linked to current capacity and more in general to sustainable tourist development. Uh, so many thanks uh, again to, to our speakers for their very precious presentations. And of course, uh, many, many thanks for all participants for, for spending your, uh, your time with, uh, with us in this webinar and also maybe in the, uh, in the other two, in the other three webinars uh, in the last uh, days. And so this webinar are part of the Proud to Share Week organized by the Alpine Agency and the Judicata UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. So uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, have a nice evening or nice afternoon. So goodbye. Thank you.
Goodbye. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you a lot also for the nice preparation. Thanks for invitation, Eric, and uh, nice evening to everyone. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Thank to you, Erica. <laughs> Thank you very much for your consideration. <laughs>